Some people love watching NASCAR races. Zooming about in circles, one laugh turn after another, for hours on end at breakneck speed. I don't get NASCAR. That seems so monotonous to me. I find harvest time in the Dakotas to be a far more exhilarating sight to behold. Why, all the equipment's already getting primed and ready, isn't it? Like a lineup of race cars awaiting the starting flag, that moment born in anticipation, when someone finally decides you've waited long enough, we're starting tomorrow. And they're off. Racing about not in a circular path of blacktop, but in precise, clean-cut rows. One after the other after the other. It's a marvel to watch combines forge through the fields, pushed to their limits with hardly a step, only stopping because they've been pushed past their limits. The friends you have repaired to get them up and running once more, running on foot even, from one piece of machinery to the next, lest a moment be wasted. Now, race cars are admittedly a bit faster than tractors and grain carts. Dakota harvest can't quite be clocked at 200 miles an hour. Wouldn't that be nice? It happens, though, at a breakneck speed of its own. But although amazing to watch from afar, the intensity of harvest time isn't always so pretty, and never has been. As evidenced by our theme this afternoon, the casualty of the first harvest festival, the first harvest at least recorded in scripture. You see, Cain and Abel faced the same adversities in their farm work as you do. Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Scripture says he had firstlings of his flock to offer, meaning he did put in his share of labor to breed, raise, and offer the very best. But at least in Montana, the joke was, if you wanted to show an animal for 4-H, all you really had to do was hose it off the morning of the fair. Cain, on the other hand, is a tiller of the ground. I think it would have been far more exciting to watch him labor, his ingenuity, how he had planned and cultivated his plots months prior in anticipation, glared, worried, and cursed at his fields the entire season, as if that would have somehow made it grow. And then to behold the race of his one-man harvest at breakneck speed. So that at the appointed time, he could present the very best fruits of his labor before the Lord. Only, after all that intensity and anguish, only to hear that his sacrifice is rejected. For God to declare it a crop failure, when anyone with a bit of sense could see how great it was, far superior to what Abel had chosen to offer the morning of. You can't just shake that kind of adrenaline, no still running full steam and filled with anger. Poor Abel becomes the first casualty of harvest stress as Cain's breakneck mentality results in breaking his brother's neck, killing him in some way. The first harvest festival ends with the first death, the first body buried in the ground, the fruit of which was our God's heart-wrenching revulsion. 
the voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Abel's blood cried out that there is now a fatal flaw to this world and us. And since that time, there has been countless more proof and evidence of this, our sin. As the Lord Jesus would later clarify, from the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. From that first harvest throughout every generation, the casualties of our ill behavior scream out the eternal punishment we deserve. Yes, such things as nosebleeds are not an uncommon byproduct of harvest time stress, but blood need not flow for the consequences of our breakneck intensity to cry out to God. The race to get the crop in can cause bitter arguments between brothers, cousins, neighbors alike, a great deal of strain in the home, and many other priorities and people to depart from mind and sight. Harvest or not, farmer or not, any time our breakneck speed to accomplish what we feel is right or needs to be done, any time your will conflicts with the needs of others or the will of God, we show forth our sin. In the breaking of promises, trust, and the breaking down of relationships with one another. The sinner might look upon this crop about to be harvested despite this season's hardships. The many accomplishments of man in this modern age or what, whatever it is you have so proudly accomplished in your own life and think with Cain, how could anyone with a bit of sense not see how great this is? But on account of sin, God calls it all a crop failure. What then made Abel and his offering so special? Why does he alone receive God's approval? Was it the quality of his work? Does God prefer sheep over wheat? Was he some sort of better person? By no means. Abel was the same sinner as Cain. The same sinner as you and me. Now we find the answer to this question, dear Christians, as to all things. In God's inerrant word. When it says, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. The answer is faith. You see, Abel had learned from his earliest youth that the result of the sinner's labor in this fallen creation is but sweat sorrow, blood, and death. His father, Adam, had taught him to trust not in his own work, but in the labor of one yet to come. The promise that God would send his only begotten son to become our brother. Not like the brother born of Eve, who would kill Abel in rage, but your brother born of Mary, who would give his own life in love. 
a love manifested in the perfect life he lived for you. Jesus, he moved at no real breakneck speed. He took his time, slowly, patiently sowing the seed of his gospel message throughout the country for three years, revealing the good news to be found in his name through many a parable, miracle, and words plain and direct. Thy sins are forgiven. Stress didn't seem to get to Jesus, but it did to many others in his life. As his hometown brothers sought to do away with him swiftly in rage, and as the Pharisees took up stones to kill him in an instant. But this was not God's plan, for his son to die the way Abel did in a heated moment. This perfect sacrifice wasn't hosed off the morning of the fair. No, the Lamb of God prepared from eternity. His passion and death happened in a way that every detail could be recorded for you to hear, learn, and treasure in your heart as your comfort and hope in this veil of tears. He carried his cross at a deliberate pace, in no straight, neat line, but a sloppy path under strain and duress, and suffered thereupon for three hours. What brought him to the grave was not the mere physical force of man, no breaking of the neck. For as scripture says, a bone of him shall not be broken. Jesus' life was broken spiritually. In the anguish of carrying on his own soul the weight of the world's sin. Oh, that blood of Abel continues to flow still today in many a form, crying out to heaven the punishment we sinners deserve, but thanks be to God there is another blood, the blood shed by your Savior, which covers it all, a blood that speaketh better things than that of Abel, far, far better for although a sinner like Abel remains in the ground to this day, death could not hold the righteous Son of God, whose body was planted in the ground, only to rise again the third day to proclaim the forgiveness of all your sins, sprouting to life once more as the first fruits of all who believe in him. Such that now ascended to God's right hand, he ever intercedes on your behalf and guides you your whole life through until his heaven is yours. As we sang, Lord, I believe thy precious blood, which at the mercy seat of God forever doth for sinners plead for me, even for my soul, it was shed. The first harvest festival centuries ago showed forth mankind's sin. But by God's grace, the point of this harvest festival is to show you your Savior. So return to your various labors and callings in life so blessed in Jesus, by his blood, with his righteousness. Oh, there's nothing wrong with a bit of our breakneck speed, 
serving God and neighbor with passion and zeal in thanksgiving for all he has given you. But when you do find your heart has failed to give forth the crop of love he desires, I pray you might realize you've been going a little too fast. Take a break. Return to him. Yes, I guess I do mean turning off the machinery and gathering in a church building. But far more important than those outward signs of devotion, I mean the worship that happens in your heart. That as you work this harvest, you might reflect on this gospel. And behold, by faith, the honor and privilege to work and subdue the Lord's creation as a picture of his tireless work among us. I think Pastor Walt Schaller appreciated what I do about harvest in the Dakotas, the thrill of watching the race to capture what the Lord has provided at its very best peak moment, because it was Pastor Schaller's intention that our first Harvest Festival would be a NASCAR pit stop of sorts. In the middle of a field, hop out of that tractor, receive Christ's word of life, and then with coffee and donut in hand, get right back to work. Not in any way to dishonor our Lord, rather out of honor and respect for the godly vocation to which the Savior has called so many of our members. Five decades later, though, this Harvest Festival has grown. The number of souls gathered together in fellowship time with one another, in the meal we share, all to the glory of God. So if you look around tonight and notice how Harvest Festival today is a little more than that first one 50 years ago, Marvel at that fact in the joy of faith. For it just goes to show how the word of the Lord ever grows. Always accomplishing that for which it is sent. Bearing fruit unto eternal life. All at a remarkable speed and power of its very own. Now the peace that passeth all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.